I am a visiting assistant professor of public health here at uh, Florida State University. I'm also the assistant director of the bachelor's in public health program. Um, and I'm a medical sociologist. Um, and so kind of what my research looks at is uh, mostly firearms and which is, you know, probably important considering that's what we're talking about tonight. Now, a lot of my research has been the focus of news articles uh, in the LA Times, uh, Reuters. Um, I've even uh, talked to a former NRA spokesperson about some of the things that I study. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, tonight though, we're gonna go right into uh, probably one of the most controversial aspects modern American culture, uh, gun ownership. We're going to look at how gun sales have changed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and why that might be. So I always like to open my talks with a uh, look at the Second Amendment because I think it's kind of important to discuss this amendment a little bit before we dive into any really serious conversations on the topic of firearms. If you look at this, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What does this mean? I mean, if you look at this particular amendment, unlike all the others, it's not grammatically correct. It, it's not a sentence. Um, and this structure of this amendment has been why we have so many debates today uh, over what the Second Amendment means. And I'm gonna repeat that. The gun debate is a relatively new debate. Up until about 1977, there were very few discussions on the Second Amendment and what it meant. Overall, the courts ruled that uh, time and again that the Second Amendment is a state's right, not an individual's right. And this doesn't change until 2008 when the Heller decision is handed down by Justice Antonin Scalia. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that case or any of the court cases that led up to uh, the Heller decision. I say all of this because there is this belief that gun laws are unconstitutional and that's not accurate. Our country has had gun laws since 1619. We've had bans, we've had limited uh, areas where guns can be carried. We've controlled who can have guns. And this has been since the uh, founding of this country as colonies. The very first gun law was passed in the very first meeting of the uh, uh, House of Commons in Virginia in 1619. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you a single question. And I want you to think back to this slide and the things that I said, and I want you to consider what I just said. Now, there are many reasons that people own guns. And many of us in this talk might be gun owners. In fact, one in four Americans are. Um, now, most people say that they own them for protection. About 67% of Americans say that that's the primary reason that they own guns. But many people also enjoy hunting and recreational shooting. I was one of those people that enjoyed recreational shooting. Um, and some of us may enjoy collecting guns or may have inherited guns from family members. The important thing to kind of remember moving forward is that gun owners are not a monolithic category. Now, sure, most gun owners are conservative white male uh, evangelicals, but that's not all gun owners and that's been changing a bit this year and until 2020 uh, it's also important to keep in mind that gun sales were pretty flat. Uh, gun sales spiked under uh, President Barack Obama but the minute he left office gun sales began to fall. So let's kind of look at that. You can see on the graph that gun sales grew dramatically while Barack Obama was in office. You can see that from about 2000 until about 2007 or 8 there, there really weren't that many big upticks in gun sales. But on the, uh, you know, month that Barack Obama was elected in November of 2008, gun sales spike and 1.1 million guns are sold at that point. Um, and guns continue to uh, rise in sales over the course of his presidency. They peak during the uh, shooting at uh, Sandy Hook in Newtown uh, and two million guns are sold. But the gun industry will brag in 2016 that they had grown 158%. Now, the election of Donald Trump had the opposite effect and you can see that in the graph. Um, at, after uh, Donald Trump came into office, gun sales kind of flatlined and started to drop off at least until March of 2020. So let's look at it a little bit differently. Um, this graph uh, highlights that mass shootings have 
traditionally had an effect on gun sales. The shooting at Sandy Hook that was shown on the last slide and is shown again here uh, resulted in the sale of two million guns. But starting in 2017, mass shootings don't have this effect. So you can see this with Las Vegas and Parkland, the shootings at Las Vegas and Parkland. Pulse was one of the last shootings noted that had this uptick, and that was in June of 2016. But when Donald Trump takes office, we don't see the same uptick in gun sales that we had previously seen and that gun manufacturers actually count on. They actually rely on the fears that result from mass shootings to encourage people to go buy guns. And so we don't see those upticks. But then the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic hit and things changed. And you can see um, this graph is uh, showing background checks, okay? And this is one of the ways that we determine how gun demand, you know, how, how it's rising or decreasing uh, based on the number of people that apply to get a uh, background check so that they can buy a gun. So this graph is the number of background checks that were completed in 2018, which is the uh, blue line, 2019, which is the orange line, and then this year, which is the purple line. Um, this data comes from the NICS, which is an acronym for the FBI's National Instant uh, Criminal Background Check System, and you can see it's not even close. Uh, in fact, in June of this year, uh, there were over uh, 3.9 million background checks conducted. In 2018, there were only 1.8 million background checks conducted. And in 2019, only, only barely 2 million. It was 2 uh, million 30,000 background checks that were conducted uh, in June of 2019. So we, we have saw this year almost double the number of background checks conducted uh, compared to years previous. So the question then is, why are we seeing such huge increases in gun sales this year? What is driving this? Why uh, are people buying guns this year when they hadn't in previous years? So I'm going to posit three events. There are fears related to three separate events that have occurred in 2020 that are actually being attributed to the rising gun sales, okay? The first is the global pandemic, and that is kind of going to be the root of all the others. The second is social unrest due to protest activity. And the third is the 2020 election. So let's briefly talk about each of these. The global pandemic has been very hard on most Americans. And as of uh, November of this year, there are 10.7 million people unemployed. As the locked downs increased across the country, uh, jobs vanished, we've had very little support from the government, and this has created a general sense of unease and for many a feeling of precariousness about their economic futures. We've also had to change many of our habits. Um, we've become isolated, we're not going out to eat, we're not meeting with friends. It, it, that has an effect on us. Um, we've also become afraid as uh, cases rise, we worry that we might get sick or that family members might get sick. And many of us know someone who's had the virus and many of us have lost someone to it. And all of this uncertainty has increased our stress. And not only has it increased stress, for a lot of us, it's increased feelings of anxiety and depression. The second event that has uh, led to this increase in gun sales is the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen social unrest play out in front of us following the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery. The death of George Floyd in particular became the catalyst for social protests this year when a video was released showing a white officer named Derek Chauvin kneeling on the neck of uh, George Floyd for nine minutes. And there was audio in that video where George Floyd was whispering, I can't breathe. And that becomes a rallying cry. Now the media will quickly jump on this and soon, all of our television sets are inundated with images from the protest. Now, research shows, and the media bared this out, that the media will almost exclusively focus on the negative aspects of social protest. So instead of focusing on you know, the largely peaceful demonstrations that made up the vast majority of these protests, they focused on very rare instances of violence, looting, and rioting where they occurred. 
And some conservative media pundits like Tucker Carlson attacked George, George Floyd's character. Carlson called Floyd an undeserving criminal who was being made into a martyr. And he and others implied that Black Lives Matter was a movement trying to destroy the social order. And it wasn't just the media that was pushing the narrative of violence and fear, but we have politicians that did the same thing. Uh, our current president condemned Black Lives Matter as a hate group days before his own Justice Department said that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is not a partisan or political organization, and days before the Justice Department also noted that uh, the violence that was being perpetrated at these protests was actually by outside groups, and they specifically named white nationalist groups uh, as being causing those. But politicians didn't really call that out. Instead, they blamed the Black Lives Matter movement and its supporters for the violent outbursts. The last event that has had an effect on gun sales is the 2020 election. Now, the 2020 election has probably been one of the most contested events in our, in our modern history. In the months leading up to the election, Trump made uh, allusions that he might not accept the results and he might not leave office if he loses. And as you can imagine, this didn't really sit well with many Americans. Uh, many Americans worried that he may not leave if he lost the election. And once the election was over, some of those fears were given a little bit of weight as Trump has refused to concede and has called the results fraud. Uh, his Twitter page has numerous tweets marked as uh, contested, where Twitter is marking them and saying that the things he's saying are not true, where he keeps calling the election results fraud, uh, keeps calling that there was voting fraud done. Um, and all of this has led to calls for violent uprisings. Uh, and these calls for violent uprisings have not really been addressed by any of the Republican leadership. Uh, the screenshot shows a message from Parler, which is the new conservative replacement for Twitter. Parler is a social movement, uh, sorry, a social media outlet that um, is claiming that they don't censor people, that they allow people to say whatever that they want to say. Um, and you can see in this screenshot, the Proud Boys uh, warn that Trump has an army at his disposal and that all he has to do is say, you know, go, uh, go get them and that that army will rise up and will fight for him. Uh, so the talks of sedition, the talks of rebellion, this unwillingness to accept the outcome of the election have all also upped up people's anxieties and their fears. But why would these events lead to increased gun sales? How are these things connected? Well, research shows that when many Americans, especially white men, feel economic uncertainty and precariousness, precariousness or they feel that they're at risk of being victimized, they will seek out re-empowerment through guns. They will seek comfort through guns because guns become an agent of empowerment. The mentality becomes, I may not be able to provide for my family, but I can keep them safe. After all, the good guy with the gun can beat the bad guy with the gun. And not only that, there are also a ton of messages that suggest guns can help improve our overall well-being. So with this thought in mind, let's examine the role that firearms play in our personal well-being. Why would these messages matter? Well, our well-being plays a huge role in our physical and mental health. The safer we feel, the more empowered we feel, the happier we are, the more control we believe we have in our lives, the better. Uh, these things all increase our well-being. But if we feel insecure or afraid, that can harm us and it will make us anxious and stressed. Um, having higher, uh, more positive well-being feelings uh, leads to healthier outcomes and vice versa. In public health, we have to straddle this line between the individual benefit and the greater societal good. Now, uh, in some places, they'll call this the cost-benefit analysis. But what we have to do is really weigh the benefits and the costs of any intervention that we do. So thinking about COVID-19, we told people to wear masks. We had to weigh what the costs of that were, like people who might have breathing issues and 
can't wear a mask, uh, so they might still get exposed, the cost of buying the masks, right? And we had to weigh that against the overall benefits that the individual uh, to the society versus that cost to the individual. Um, and then make a decision and decided for COVID-19 that wearing the mask, the cost wasn't uh, higher than the benefit, so we paid the cost. So any intervention that we take, we have to decide where the cost and the benefits are and which one benefits more, the, the individual or the society. So in other words, if a behavior has an individual benefit to health or well-being, then we cannot overly impose restrictions on that behavior just because doing so will have a societal benefit. So let's look at some of the rhetoric concerning guns and well-being. And let's start with some of the negative rhetoric first. There is a rhetoric that suggests that gun owners are cowards. And when we consider that 67% of gun owners claim that they bought a gun primarily for self-defense, we can see where people might believe that. So let's go through just some messages. We, we see these kinds of messages in social media. I see guns as a sign of weakness. I always walk outside unarmed and I'm not afraid because no one will with me. While most gun owners are always fearful and need reassurance. We see it memes. This is exactly what's wrong with this generation. Cowards like you pull out guns because you can't fight. Only a coward will use a gun to protect and get respect for themselves. Blank curve. Courage, I have a gun. Gun violence is for cowards. We also see in political ads, guns, the weapons of cowards. Stop the lies, stop the NRA, guns kill. If you own a gun, you are a spineless coward. In mass shootings, repeal the Second Amendment. We even see it in the news media. So outlets like The Guardian, uh, Salon, The Washington Post, and The New York Times have all run articles that conflate cowardice with gun ownership. Uh, you can see on your screen, want a gun? Take a bullet. Take this gutless NRA cowards. Uh, and following the uh, shootings in Texas, in El Paso, scared Hispanic Americans rushed to buy guns. And even academics perpetuate this idea that fear leads to gun ownership. So you can see that perceived risk of victimization and fear of crime might lead some people who do not own guns to uh, consider acquiring a gun. And there's, you see a lot of people in that string site because a lot of people have said this. Uh, in another study, they found that if they were afraid of being victimized in their own neighborhood, they would uh, likely go out and buy a gun. Now, before we uh, go into whether or not these rhetorics are true or not. Let, let's look at some of the other uh, ideas. But I want you to keep in mind that these messages that we just went over all paint one clear picture of gun owners, that they are fearful children who need guns like Linus needed his security blanket. For those of you who have watched the Peanuts cartoon, I'm probably dating myself a little bit there. But the way that Linus needed that blanket to go out and interact with the other children, that's what those memes are suggesting and those advertisements and things are suggesting about gun owners. But let's come back to that idea in just a second. Uh, let's look at some of the other rhetoric because there are also positive rhetorics about guns. Um, there's rhetoric that suggests gun owners sleep better because of their guns. So in 1993, a columnist at the Washington Times wrote that people sleep peacefully in their beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Now this quotation has been misattributed to George Orwell and Winston Churchill. You can see both of their names on your screen, okay? It's been sold on t-shirts. It's been put on social media posts of people like Wayne LaPierre, who's the former president of the NRA, and Dana Lash, who's a former spokesperson for the NRA. They've all shared it and attributed it to George Orwell or to Winston Churchill. Um, and while some scholars may view this background as little more than provocative gun culture, when we saw these kinds of discussions, we felt that they needed to be addressed because we needed to know whether or not guns do provide uh, the benefit of uh, improving sleep. Um, so the idea that guns help people to sleep is then put forward by these very powerful interest groups like the NRA popular media, social media, pop culture, and commercial products, such as the Patriot Pillow. 
Um, today, many people sleep with guns next to their beds or under their pillows, uh, and they do so to comfort themselves at night. And products like the Patriot Pillow or the Pillow Safe have been developed to provide easy access to instruments of personal protection. Uh, in one study of women in the military, a younger officer described how she prepared for the possibility of sexual assault while on active duty by saying, while I was in Iraq, I was hypersensitive and vigilant. I wasn't supposed to chamber around in my nine millimeter, but I did, and I slept with it under my pillow. In an article in Mail Magazine, um, a man offered the following about the pistol he kept next to his bed. It helps me sleep better, and it gives me comfort. It gives me comfort to have some life insurance too in case something happened to me. And in that same article, the author concluded, for millions of Americans, there's no better blanket uh, in security offered than that of a gleaming lead chamber uh, with a vault. There's also rhetoric that suggests guns make you happy. So these are some of my favorite of the memes that we've seen. Uh, there is rhetoric put forward, not this one, not so much by the NRA, but by gun manufacturers. They would say things like, you know, they said money can't buy you happiness. Uh, they lied or it can buy you guns and ammunition. And that's the same thing. Uh, a lot of gun manufacturers did this. And so again, just like with uh, sleep, just like with uh, fear, we were really interested in do guns uh, lead to uh, self-reported happiness, like higher levels of being happy. There's also these tweets, um, guns make me happy, why would the government ever take them away? Uh, you can see the second one is a um, advertisement from Brownells Inc., which is a gun manufacturer, and they say happiness is one quarter to guns, and guns make up one quarter happiness. Uh, Senator Rand Paul said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are secured through the Second Amendment. And then a person named Devin Lane said, guns make me happy, and I'll be damned if I let someone take away my happiness. The last one that I'm going to bring up before we kind of go dive into these is that there was also a rhetoric that suggested that guns can improve your lives. So, got a couple of tweets here. Thank the good Lord for guns. I love all of them. Started shooting at age five, hunting at age six, and have all my life. Thank you, Winchester, Browning, and all the other manufacturers. It makes me feel better that everyone is arming themselves. Uh, and then the Masked Avenger wrote a, a tweet to uh, Joe Biden. It would make my life better if someone would repeal the roughly 80% of gun laws that are unconstitutional. Can I count on you and uh, Kamala to do that. So this is really where my research kind of comes in, okay? I wanted to know, is any of this true? Are gun owners cowards? Are gun owners happier? Do gun owners sleep better at night? Do gun owners lead more fulfilling lives? So let's start with guns and fear. Despite claims to the contrary, gun ownership is not associated with fears and phobias. The connection that does exist suggests that gun owners are less afraid than non-gun owners. So we took uh, a index of 12 fears and phobias, and we measured whether or not gun owners or non-gun owners scored higher in that index. And we found that overall, there wasn't much difference. But in a few key areas, gun owners exhibited less fear. Okay. Um, now, why do these kind of myths persist? Well, one possible explanation is that these myths are so prevalent because the mainstream discourse on gun ownership from popular culture characterizes that those who own guns are fearful or weak. And these representations are omnipresent. They appear in editorial pieces and prominent news publications. They appear in social media, movies, and other forms of pop culture. Uh, you can see on your screen on the left, that is from an the very first issue of Batman in 1941, uh, where he says, well, kids, there's your proof. Crooks are yellow without their guns. Um, another piece published uh, in Salon claimed that gun ownership gives cowards the heart to stand tall. 
uh, in a 2013 op-ed in the Daily Kos, uh, they argued that there's one basic truth, gun owners are cowards. And again, back on your screen with Batman, um, you see that uh, a gun is a coward's weapon, a liar's weapon. We kill too often because we've made it easy, too easy, sparing ourselves the mess and the work. Um, the, this has been a consistent message in, in comic books for Batman pretty much since uh, the beginning. Um, we also see it in films. The movie Rush Hour, Detective James Carter tells the character Sang to put down his gun and fight him like a man. You hear the same rhetoric in the movie Friday. Um, so we, we have these kinds of messages that constantly inundate us with this idea that gun owners are cowards. And that makes us believe when we think about it, oh yeah, the only reason someone would carry a gun is because they're a coward. The second thing that we wanted to address was the happiness. So you remember that the, uh, the people's tweets and things said that guns made them happy. Um, and there's several reasons why this could be true. Now first, gun owners believe that guns help them to feel safe. And so this is kind of what we kind of show in the, in the fear research that people are less afraid because they feel safer. So, you know, if that, if, Gun, if guns actually make you feel safe, then it makes sense that you will be happier. Uh, second, gun owners claim that guns are empowering and contribute to a subjective sense of independence and personal control over their lives. So firearms are appealing because they can be intimidating and they can also bestow feelings of power. So according to one study, many people believe that holding a loaded gun or carrying a gun would make them feel really powerful or powerful and strong. And third, Gun owners will tell you that guns are pleasurable. And these are ideas that are linked to very strong hunting cultures and very uh, strong sporting traditions and recreational subcultures. And all of these things, the, the feelings of pleasure, the feelings of security, the feelings of empowerment are linked to feelings of happiness. But when we examined whether guns were associated with happiness, we found that they weren't. Um, in fact, when we first looked at it, we found that marriage is actually a better predictor. Married people just turned out to be happier than single people. Uh, and so when we put marriage into our statistical analysis, we realized that the, any relationship between guns and happiness went away. Um, now, there was one small caveat to that, that we found that Democrats were actually made happier by guns. And we can talk about why that might be at the end of the talk. But that was the, that was the only finding that linked happiness with firearms. The third item that we brought up is the idea that guns give you better sleep. Because just like with happiness, if something empowers you or makes you feel safe, then it reduces fear, it reduces stress, provides pleasure, increases feelings of security, and all of these things are linked to better sleep. But do they sleep better? Again, the answer ended up being no. So when we looked at whether or not gun owners slept better than non-gun owners, what we found was is that the difference could really be explained by the type of neighborhood that you lived in. That gun owners who lived in neighborhoods that they perceived as potentially dangerous or uh, stressful or had other stress in their lives were much more likely to report poor sleep. Uh, and the gun didn't mitigate any of that. The last uh, measure of well-being that we kind of uh, talked about briefly is life satisfaction. Now life satisfaction could be considered the ultimate measure of well-being because how satisfied with your life is a sum of how happy you are, how safe you feel, how secure you are, and how content you are with all the aspects of your life. So you're happy in your marriage, in your job, all of those things are measures of your overall life satisfaction. 
And there are several reasons gums could be linked to your life satisfaction. And they're very similar to the reasons we would expect them to be linked to happiness because the same kinds of feelings of security and empowerment and pleasure that guns supposedly give you also are related to things that are related to life satisfaction. Um, but like with sleep and happiness, there wasn't a, there, there's not a connection that gun owners aren't any more satisfied with their lives than non-gun owners. They don't report any better uh, life satisfaction. So let's go back to why it matters. The benefits that guns provide, well, my research shows that they're either temporary or not strong enough to offset potential detriments to well-being, such as the fact that firearms are dangerous. Um, when we think about what gun ownership means, a lot of people talk about self-defense, but when we actually look at the research on it, guns are very rarely used for self-defense. In fact, only uh, less than 1% of crimes are stopped by self-defense gun use. And in the times that a gun is used in the operation of self-defense, they end up more likely to hurt themselves than to hurt the assailant. So if you try and draw a gun to protect yourself, the research suggests that you are more likely to suffer an injury than the person you're drawing the gun on. And a lot of that has to do with the, uh, by the time you realize that there's a threat, it's probably already too late to react to the threat. Outside of self-defense, gun ownership also increases the likelihood of some negative outcomes. So let's talk about a few of these. The first is suicide. So first, let's uh, dispel one myth about guns and gun violence in America. The majority of gun deaths in the United States are not homicides, they're not mass shootings, they're suicides. In fact, 62% of all gun deaths in the U.S. are suicides. 51% of all suicides are completed by a firearm. So that's the really the biggest impact that gun ownership has. Um, and states that have lower gun ownership have lower suicide rates than states with higher gun ownership. Guns are also uh, known to be linked to the increased uh, risk of violence to women. So women in the United States are 16 times more likely to be killed with a gun than women in other high-income countries, making the United States the most dangerous country in the developed world when it comes to gun violence against women. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation makes it five times more likely that that woman will be killed. Today, about 4.5 million American women have been threatened with a gun by an intimate partner, nearly a million more have been shot or shot at by an intimate partner, and in an average month, 50 American women are shot to death by their partners. There's also a large risk to children. Firearms are the second leading cause of death for American children and teens, and the first leading cause of death for black children and teens. Gun suicides among children have increased by 30%. 40% of victims in domestic violence mass shootings are children. And in 16% 16 of the accidental shootings involving children, it's because the guns were mistaken for toys or in more tragic events where a person had a gun under their pillow or in their nightstand and a small child found it and shot themselves or a family member. So the question then becomes, why do we still have these conceptions of gun ownership? If there's little evidence to suggest that guns benefit personal well-being, how are these conceptions maintained? And one possibility is that these notions are merely figments of gun culture. And studies that look at how guns affect our well-being are really important because guns have the capacity to undermine our health and the safety of individuals, family members, and the broader society. So as a researcher, we argue that we should formally assess any of these widespread claims concerning the personal benefits of owning a gun as we would any other health-related behavior or recommendation related to diet or exercise. 
these kind of claims that guns will make you safer or make you feel happier are worthy of examination because they can motivate gun ownership and be weighed against the established risks to public health. So it, we can look at does restricting gun access actually restrict freedom um, because we can examine whether or not the gun access actually does anything positive for you, if there's any benefit. Given that gun-related injuries, murders, and suicides have become a way of life in America, this excess morbidity and mortality we can't be denied. Um, and all that remains to be considered are the personal benefits of gun ownership, of which I have shown this evening there are very few. So this leads to my question to all of you. Thinking about this individual benefit of the individual versus the social good, if there are no real benefits to gun ownership, they don't make you safer, if they don't make you feel happier, if they don't help you sleep better at night, if guns don't improve your life and make you feel better, whose interest should we be more concerned with as public health people? the individual or the society. And that where I will stop for questions. This has got one here in the chat. Okay. Um, Nancy, um, how large was your sample size and where did you obtain your sample? Okay, okay uh, so we use multiple samples. So uh, in the fear paper, we use the uh, uh, Chapman Survey of American Fears. It was uh, about 1,300 people nationally, uh, national sample uh, in that. It was uh, collected by, uh, I want to say Gallup uh, for Chapman University. It's the largest uh, data set of phobias and fears uh, in the United States. Um, for the happiness uh, and life satisfaction and sleep papers, we used mostly uh, what is called the general social survey. Um, and we looked at waves that went back as far as 1972, all the way up to uh, 2018, which is the newest, most up-to-date wave. Uh, each wave had anywhere from uh, 1,500 to uh, a few thousand individuals in each wave. And we've measured it over time to see uh, how those uh, looked. And in some cases, we compared it across different data sets to see if their different data sets were all in line or if they were, if differences popped up. So we also used the Baylor Religion Survey, which is collected by uh, uh, Baylor University, uh, the GSS, uh, Chapman. We compared some of those to see, did, Know, were the findings consistent as a way to kind of see, you know, if any of these patterns have changed or uh, were changing. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Not yet. Um, can you, is there a correlation between the number of gun owners within an area and crime statistics? Yes. Um, there is, okay. So, so one of the things that uh, research has kind of pointed out is that uh, more guns does not equal less crime. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, areas that have higher uh, gun ownership have more murders and more violent crime. Um, so, you know, the, if you go to the CDC website and you go to the stats of the states and look at gun deaths, the... Uh, the worst states are Alabama, Louisiana, Alaska, and Missouri, states that have very, very liberal gun laws, meaning that they just allow anybody to have a gun. Mm -hmm. And the states with the fewest gun deaths are states like uh, Cal uh, California, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. So if we compare Florida, for instance, to California, Florida has 12.7 gun deaths per 100,000 people. California has 7.9. New York has 3.7. New Jersey has 5.1. Um, less than half. Texas has 15.4, right? Uh, Louisiana has like, I think, 21.2. Um, let me double check that. Uh, 
before I quote that one. Um, but the, the states that have the, the, the loosest gun laws uh, mm -hmm. tend to have the, the, the most gun deaths. Uh, and it's interesting too, also that includes homicide and suicide. So one of the more interesting findings by a man named Michael Anestis uh, was that states that have stricter gun laws actually have fewer suicides by any method. Mm -hmm. So not only do gun suicides go down, but mm -hmm. all suicides go down. That's interesting. Um, and part of that is, is that, first of all, it, it, suicide by any method other than a gun has a very small chance of you dying. You, mm -hmm. you can be mm -hmm. saved if you're found in time. Mm -hmm. But a gun is, it, 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 it's, it's not as easy. And mm -hmm. if Brian commits suicide with a gun, it's almost a guaranteed. Okay. Um, Got another one here um, from Ron. The larger question of rejection of facts that don't fit people's worldview seems very difficult to address to play a role in gun ownership? Please comment. Yeah, so, you know, there's been plenty of people published findings that say that if you have a deeply held belief system that you are not going to believe any science or data that comes your way, right? And I think though, I think that's where my research kind of is useful, is that, you know, if you think about the guns or, you know, gun owners are cowards thing. Um, if you come into a conversation with somebody that you're wanting to address the issue of gun control and you immediately like call them a coward, are they going to want to talk to you? Are they going to want to have a conversation with you? Are they going to be open to any conversation that you have? I think the other thing is, is that, um, you know, there are a lot of responsible gun owners out there, right? Like most of them are perfectly fine. And, you know, it, it will take conversations with those individuals and the people who don't own guns to, to come to compromises on what is like an acceptable, you know, uh, measure, right? One thing we didn't talk about tonight, though, is that there's very little research on guns. So in, in sociology, what I do, there are like 12 of us that study it, and it's all mostly recent. And that's because in 1996, uh, Congress passed a rider on the omnibus uh, spending bill that funds our government every year. We can't pass a budget. We just pass these riders um, called the Dickey Amendment, uh, named after Jay Dickey, who was a representative from uh, Arkansas. Uh, and what that said was, uh, you know, I'll paraphrase it, is that any research uh, conducted that paints guns in a negative light will immediately lose all federal funding. So this was aimed at the CDC because in the 1990s, the CDC was starting to give out grants to colleges and uh, uh, public health institutions to do gun research to see if they're safe or not. And so Congress passed this and that basically became a moratorium on gun research. And this is why we don't have a lot of research that we can really say, no, here's what shows that guns are bad because institutions were afraid that they would lose federal funding. Think about it for a minute. If FSU lost all of its federal funding, how would we stay open, right? So a lot of institutions immediately shied away from doing any research, which is why like, if you wanna know, uh, do states with stricter gun laws uh, result in fewer deaths, you just have to go to the CDC website and look at the number of deaths. But can we say, that it's definitively about those gun laws. No, because we can't do the research really to look at that. All we know is the raw numbers. It's a pretty strong correlation, right? States with stricter laws have fewer deaths, but maybe there's something else going on. The other thing to consider is maybe the laws that we have, maybe some of them work, maybe some of them don't. And without doing research to kind of look at it, we can't really answer the question of which one is which, right? Um, you know, if, if we could get rid of that rider uh, out of the budget because it's been passed every year since 1996. It's still there. Um, then we could we could find out what actually works and what doesn't work as far as gun laws, right? And then we could get rid of any of those that are just burdens on the gun owner and uh, just keep the ones that actually are effective. Hey, James has a question. Actually, James has two questions. What are the differences between attitudes uh, men and women towards guns? And how can we depoliticize the conversation about guns and change it to an issue about public health? Okay. All right. So uh, let's start with the gender. First, uh, um, 
many, many people will say that, that gun ownership is almost entirely a white male phenomenon, right? It's, it's men. Um, I've got a paper that hopefully will be coming out next year on gender role beliefs. And it's kind of fascinating. Let me see. I'm going to see if I can share the screen with you just to show you this graph, because I think it's kind of interesting to kind of look at. And it kind of gets at what, what James was asking. So give me one second here while I pull this up. Um, the uh, thing to keep in mind, though, is that there are definite gender differences, that men and women come into this question uh, a little bit differently uh, each. So give me one second here. Nope, not that one. Here it is. And I'm going to share the screen again, and we'll look at this together. Now, this is a very gendered color. This is actually from my dissertation, um, and I did it this way just so it could very easily be seen. Uh, but you can see the, uh, the pink line represents women, the blue line represents men. So let me, I'll explain how, this, uh, how to read this particular graph. We'll make it a little bit bigger so that you can see it. Okay. Um, so it, these are nine different uh, well, eight different policies and then gun ownership. Um, and so if you look at the, the, the x-axis down here the, at the top on the traditional gender role ideology from low to high, what that means is, is that anyone that scored on a one, they're pretty liberal. They, they don't believe that women should be at home in the you know, kitchen and taking care of children. And people who scored a four, they have those beliefs. They believe that in those traditional gender roles. And then the uh, uh, y-axis is likelihood to agree to a uh, some kind of gun law. So the the one in the top corner on the left is uh, they agree with banning semi-automatic weapons ban. Now look at this because it's pretty pretty telling that for men, as belief in traditional gender role increases, they are much less likely to support banning a semi-automatic weapon like the AR-15. But for women, the line is flat. And they're more likely to, if you look at where they're at, so from zero, zero meaning uh, we don't support the ban to a one saying we support the ban, that's how the variable's coded, the line is flat all the way across the top, right? Where women, regardless of gender role, believe are okay with banning semi-automatic weapons. And it's pretty much that way with every single law except for two. The only two that it actually mattered was expanding safety programs where women with the most traditional beliefs, they join men in not supporting that. And then um, increasing armed security in schools. So having police officers or uh, private security in a school system with children, the that's really the only one that there's really like a gendered, gender role difference and that men and women are the same. So that's, that's kind of that. Um, as far as trying to get it to talk about it from a public health perspective, before the pandemic, I would have said that would have been a great way to go about it. Um, but we've seen so much politicization uh, against doctors right now where people are accusing hospitals of making up numbers of people dying from COVID. Um, we're seeing, you know, uh, people like attacking people like Dr. Fauci for, you know, uh, you know, his stances on masks over the course of the pandemic, right? Um, that I don't know that any, that the public health argument, you know, would, would work right now uh, because I think that we have, become so polarized in positions that we are kind of like leaning to whatever our political party alignment says. So if our party says science bad, then that's where we fall. And if our, you know, party says, no, we should trust the doctors, that's where we fall. Uh, so that, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, Phyllis is back with her question about which state has the most gun owners. Texas. Texas has the most gun owners. Has the you most should know that, Phyllis. <laughs> yeah, Texas has about 10 times as many as other states. Um, now they are, um, you know, uh, Florida, Alabama, uh, Texas, and Illinois have the highest number of concealed carry in the country. Um, Alabama actually has the highest percentage of its population 
Now, granted, they're a much smaller population, but more of that population owns guns and concealed carries than any of the other states. You have any other questions? No? I just want to say thank you, Dr. Dad Arrow. It has been uh, fascinating to listen to you. Um, I think we've all learned a lot, given us a lot to think about, and especially during this time, um, pandemic, and um, essentially a health crisis and a political crisis um, as we go into a new year. Um, not sure where all our heads are going to be, but uh, hopefully we're all. Uh, moving forward and uh, learning a lot from all of our mistakes this year and getting getting the best out of it. Um, oh, James says thank you a lot to think about. Yes, James, I agree. A whole lot to think about. Um, so as we move forward, we're going to move on into 2020, 2021. Uh, we do have a, a lecture schedule in January and February. I'll get, be getting those posted. Our first one in January is going to be on oysters. So um, by January 10th, you'll be able to order oysters and get those delivered. Um, some of you, not all of you, will be able to. <laughs> uh, some of you that are uh, out of the country uh, will not be able to have those delivered, but um, those of you in town, if you're interested, um, there is a link or you can um, uh, call her directly and have your oysters delivered and enjoy them during the lecture. So make sure you go on our website to the events page and uh, check that out. Um, I hope you all have a great holiday and uh, stay safe. Please stay safe and um, be careful out there. I know it's a trying time for everybody and I just look forward to seeing all of you in a new year and uh, everybody happy and healthy. Thank you again, Dr. Dowd Arrow. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Bye bye.